one, we're on. Bom dia, pessoal. Tudo bem? Good morning. I hope you're fine. My name is Adriano Pedrosa, the Artistic Director of MASP, the Museum of Art of São Paulo, Assis Chateaubriand. I am here to make a brief introduction about our third seminar dedicated to queer histories. This is the third year where we are holding these seminars. We're holding one a year. And those seminars are a preparation for the year that is dedicated to queer histories, to diversity, such as gender diversity and sexual diversity. And that celebration is going to take place at our museum MASP in 2024. Those seminars are also important, not just for us to prepare to individual monographic exhibitions we have during the year, but most especially it's going to be important for the collective exhibition that we organize at the end of the year, which is going to be in December 2024, and it's going to be called Queer Histories. This exhibition is curated by Julia Bryan Wilson, our adjunct curator for contemporary art, helped by Leandro Mumi who is an assistant, uh, curatorial assistant at MASP and supported by myself. I would like to thank especially the mediation team that worked on the preparation of the seminar as well as our production team. More specifically, I would like to thank the organizers of the seminar who worked with me in this project, André Mesquita, who is the curator and leader of the mediation team and public policies, Davi Ribeiro, who is the curatorial assistant, and Julie Brian Wilson, curator at large of modern contemporary art. I would like to thank all participants of these two day seminar. We have a Ravani Art Project, Chol, which is represented by Pomina, also Chola Pobletti, Felipe Rivas San Martin, Joshua Chambers Latson, Stella Mianzi. Toin Voita, Uva Bressan, and Zeto Matebeni. So let me tell you how we organize the program of the museum around different queer histories. I believe that some of you were familiar with our program. You're familiar with the exhibitions that we carry as well as the seminars. But it's important to go over that again because sometimes we have new people with us. Since 2016, we've organized a series of exhibitions focused on different histories. In 2017, those stories include included the whole year. In 2016, we had an exhibition dedicated to childhood histories, and in 2017, sexuality histories, 2018, Afro-Atlantic histories, in 2019, women and feminist histories, and in 2020, dance histories. We skipped this year, then we had a biannual meeting because of the pandemic. And in 2022, we had Brazilian histories and which, because of the uh, centennial anniversary of our independence. And we also had indigenous histories and we're going to open the collective related to indigenous histories as of October 20th. So we're going to have a, an exhibition at the museum then. Next year, we will focus on histories of diversity or queer histories. 
we chose those histories in a way of getting us closer. They focus more on culture, they focus on what relates to our day-to-day -day lives, and this is more so than histories related to art history, for example. Of course, we are not totally abandoning the narratives of art history, but it's important to understand that the narratives of art history are just another layer of many histories that we have in our lives and that we try to get closer to. And uh, in Portuguese, in French, and in Spanish, when we use the word history, sometimes is uh, is different when you talk, talk about stories and when we talk about histories. Stories can mean fictional and non-fictional reports could be personal, political um, reports, reports related to art history. So. In this very wide arching understanding, we will tell those stories because this aligns to the mission of our museum that aims to be plural. We also talk about stories that are open, more polyphonic, more internal and speculative. All of that reflects in many ways on the programs that we put together for our seminars and for the exhibition that we are going to open in December next year. So now I will turn over to Davi Ribeiro, who is going to mediate the first roundtable of this seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention, and I hope that you enjoy it. Muito obrigado, Adriano, pelas palavras. Uh, Thank you, bom dia. Adriano, for your kind words. Well, good morning, good uh, afternoon or good evening to everyone. My name is Davi Ribeiro. I am the Curatorial Assistant of Mediation and Public Policies of MASP, and I wish you welcome, whether you are watching us live or in this recording. So, before the three speeches we are going to have, it's important to say we will have some time for debate, so feel free to send us your questions or comments through the chat, because later on we're going to send them to our guests. We're also going to put on the chat the attendance list if you want to get a certificate of participation in this seminar. These certificates will be produced for those who attend this the two days of this seminar. This seminar is being broadcast in three different links on YouTube. YouTube. In one of them, you can hear the original language of the speakers, while in the other two channels, you can hear people in Portuguese or in English. So, now, to open the first round of discussion, I would like to invite Chola Poblete, a multidisciplinary artist that creates and delivers performances, photo performances, video art, photographs, paintings, drawings, and objects. She has a bachelor's degree in, art, in visual arts from the National University of Cuyo, and also had some background in non-institutional uh, training with artists. She also participated in the artist program at Universidad Torquato di Tella in 2018 on the art focus of the Museo Marco Museum in 2018 on the laboratory Acción de Complejo Teatral in Buenos Aires in 2019. She had collective and individual exhibitions, including La Marco Original, Exercizio del Pianto, Slave, and more recently in the individual exhibition Pop Art at Kunsthalle Lisbon in Portugal. She was awarded with the Banco Ciudad 2022 award and was elected Artist of the Year 2023 from the Deutsche Bank. Her talk is entitled Chola Virgins. So, I'll turn over to you. Welcome. Hola a todos. Gracias por convocar. Hello everyone. It is a pleasure to be invited. I'm very excited to be participating in the seminar. Bueno, voy a empezar por a citar 
eh, una parte I will start un que escribí, by eh, quoting a manifest that I wrote. It's called Popandino. Popandino. So I am going to talk about the Chola Virgins. This is a series of works where the main protagonists are the virgins. My gender is artist. You shouldn't label me otherwise. So drag, trans, or anything. I am a man, I am a woman. I'm air, I'm a serpent, I'm water. My, there are infinite ways of being and on turning on everything and everyone without losing my essence. I don't know what I am, I know what I'm not. In these pieces, in this work, the virgins, they are main protagonists. Here we can see, and I'm not sure whether you can see the images. Okay, here they are. So here we can see textures where sensuality, violence, are blended in this dispute of a privileged space. The saints, you see, women, they are held by the weight of history are just signs of a culture in crisis. Braids, potatoes, uh, noses, and stains, they overflow and fall on creatures with penises and high heeled shoes. Everything is part of the same chaotic and necessary landscape, a large battlefield where dancing may mean both struggle and leisure. In the movies, it could also be the femme fatale, the mysterious woman that uses her attributes with mean purposes. But this is a character that engages the plot of the movie. Instead of having fatalities, we are talking about vitality, something that is dear to men along the same lines. Those works show a fierce shock with reality. They want to break the gray mass of the day-to-day -day lives in pursuing transformation. This nameless dance is a constant pursuit. So let's move to the other images. These virgins have some specific features. They represent a part of the place where I come from in Mendoza, which is a province in Argentina, close to the Andes chain, close to Chile. These compositions somehow are like songs for me. I feel that I'm composing a song. Each element is a word, and there is a narrative around the virgins. These relate to daily routines, to being in areas or fields of the Argentinian pop art, the nightlife, my friends, people who are part of the underworld, sex workers. I'm also talking about lack of love or intimate issues. So let's move to the next images. In this case, for example, we can see one of the non-binary virgins. These reflects 
something that all of us are looking for, moving away from a non-binary world, moving away from the idea of what is recognizable and what we supposedly should be or where we supposedly should be headed to regarding our identity. There's also a reference here to what we used to be the Pomajala drawings. You can see the atrocious facts that took case during when we were conquered, or recurring elements such as potatoes. For me, they have different meanings, both in history and in history, as well as personally. So when I talk about potatoes, when I talk about papa, which is the word in Spanish, and this can also be papa, which is the Spanish word for father. So I can play, have a play on words and turning collective issues into individual issues, and that can reach different people. So here we have a recent image. This image was shown in an exhibition called Guaymagen. This is an exhibition held in Berlin. And back then, during this exhibition, what I did was I put my body representing a virgin in a place that is very common in Argentina. Argentina is known for its meat. So, in the lower part, of this image, you can see a Mormon person. I work a lot with religious images, and Mormon devouts were part of my life, and that was not a very part of my life in the past. So in this case, I was trying to go through these, con tr making this transition, questioning my faith, my identity, and I didn't find anything in those places of faith. I felt expelled from those environments. So this is like a fetish. Here I also address the differences between what we think Argentina to be, like a white Argentina, not a brown Argentina. Next image. Also the bread works. This is a sculpture made of bread. These has to do with the virgins that were used. And you could only sculpt to that in the upper part, there were no sexual organs in virgin, so the lower part of their bodies were not used. I found this idea very weird vis-a-vis -vis what I see as a body. And I used bread because I wanted to think of a body as a shape, not as the body itself. I did not want it to, to be something easy to recognize, and I wanted to move away from the gender definition. I wanted to think about the many identities that there can be behind a mask. So a few years ago, I started producing some masks made of bread, and this matter, this dough that I used was very interesting. Those are independent elements. I can give it shape, but once you put that under heat, 
in an oven, it changes. It has some vitality into it. So if you put this dough in a moist area, you see that once again it changes. It goes through transformations. And I find this very interesting. I believe that as an artist who began its working in an and kind of an underworld scenario and then move to different scenarios which involve different performances. It was interesting seeing the discipline of it and it was interesting creating some theories about the body. This may sound some old fashioned and this is why we should talk about vitality in everything around us. And this is why I like working with bread and also watercolors. And watercolors bring water and it creates new shapes and it mixes different colors. So the idea of abstracting a body or a shape and see the mutilated parts in a composition is very interesting to me because these are parts of the body, but they are not related to anything in particular. They are just parts. Now let's take a look at the next images. Now we are going to see the masks. I believe I've touched on this issue previously in my presentation about uh, dealing with more recognizable shapes. And then later I started working with masks. Here you can see the masks on these images. And later I started to experiment with the creation of performances using these pieces and how they could have an action on their own. On the next image, you can see the result. I think we have another image. I'm very much interested in how and the different ways of working with bread. I am a mainstream artist and therefore I need to be close to the market. These are very uh, hard to acquire and preserve pieces, but I like that. I like to be seen as a virus in the way I work with activism or artivism. I don't want to be seen as a person or an artist that occupies the streets that's behind us. You know, staying at the same place, that's not what I want. I want to be like a virus. And I want to be present in museums that are like great cathedrals to me. So that I can talk about the things that I want to talk about without any issues related to censorship. Argentina is not white. This is actually a sentence that I have been uh, thinking about for a long time when I started to question myself as an artist, when I started to question myself about what type of artist I wanted to be when I was 20 or 19 years old when I came out, I started to question what kinds of works I wanted to produce. And I was very lucky because I would travel to Spain, to Madrid, and I visited museums. But at that time, I didn't uh, had uh, I hadn't traveled to Buenos Aires. And the next year, I went there and I saw the museums in Buenos Aires, and I noticed that all modern pieces of works reflected that idea of the things that we bring from Europe and that idea of believing that the Argentines descended from ships 
to our country and that Argentina is like a smaller scale Paris. But I want to steer away from that idea of living in a country that is isolated within Latin America. And I felt that I did not relate personally to those works of art. So I was thinking about the classical concepts of, our, of art, for example, uh, beauty, hegemony. And I remember that I bought some wigs at that time and I took pictures as Chola at that time. Chola is actually a derogatory word that is used specifically in Mendoza, which is a province where there is a big a community of people coming from the northern part of Argentina and Bolivia, and they go there, they go to Mendoza to work at the wineries, because that is a wine-producing region. And at that region, there is a striking social class uh, gap, and there is also a great uh, difference between being brown, for example, and of other ethnicities. If you are from Bolivia, for example, you might not realize that in Argentina we do have indigenous peoples that are a big part of what our country is. So as a result of all of those questions, I started working on these images to produce my own images and my own belief in terms of how to write the history of Argentina. And at the same time, uh, these pictures are old. I took them around 2013. And right about the same time, I started meeting with other artists working on the same topics. There is a group, a very well-known group here in Argentina, Identidade Marron. And they are activists in anything related to structural racism and the invisibility of discriminated peoples. And on the next image, you can also see Chola. There's this work of art in Argentina called La Chola by an artist uh, called Alfredo Guido. And this is a white chola. That, that is why this piece of work is so special. This is a white chola in the context of Latin America. I believe that this uh, makes it very clear about what people think in Argentina. And in my opinion, Argentina is not white, it is brown. And with that, I conclude my presentation. Gracias por escucharme. Obrigada pela atenção. Thank you very much, Achola, for your presentation. I would like to remind all of you that you can ask questions using the chat feature. We're going to leave some time at the end for Q&A. And now, to move on to the next presentation, I would like to invite Purnima Sukumar, representing Aravani Art Project. It is a project with its modality of collaborating and creating along with the people from the transgender community ensures to excavate the wisdom that they have inculcated over the years. By diving deep into their culture and traditional practices, the project examines their spaces of innovation and the places of their history and creates new spaces by transforming this knowledge into art. By bringing the nuances of trans lives, narratives, and lived experiences to the forefront of their fight, 
we aim to embrace the people from the transgender community by creating consciousness, awareness, and social participation through the arts. The presentation by Aravaniar Project is named Yesterday, Today, Every Day. Pornima, over to you. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be speaking uh, all the way from India, across so many seas. And yet, there are so many uh, beautiful similarities, uh, especially with our cultures and maybe our landscapes. Um, a little bit uh, about uh, the project. The Aravani Art Project is transgender and cis women collaborative. Uh, the idea was to inculcate intersectionality from the very beginning. Um, India is growing really fast in so many aspects, but the people in India are still very stuck in time, especially with related to a lot of uh, public uh, violence and uh, the Transgender people are subjected to a lot of discrimination, even now in the 20, 21st century. Um, unfortunately, a lot of uh, classism and a lot of caste and racism also exists in India, but they are very deep rooted. More than all of these things, the most important battle we are all facing here is the severe and the very uh, popular patriarchal system that we have, uh, you know, deep in the history. As you all know, India has also been ruled by the Britishers for such a long time. And a lot of laws were laid down against the transgender community uh, after the Britishers uh, came to India. Before the Britishers uh, came to India, the transgender people were a little more respected within our kingdoms. Uh, they were treated as trustworthy people within the kingdoms and were treated as royal subjects. Uh, we have a lot of mythological stories about gods becoming goddesses or converting or transforming into women to attract the kind of person they would want to fall in love with or because they are feeling queer. And so we have always had an existence of fluidity in our myths and mythological stories. All of this was a very big curiosity for the reason why Aravani Art Project started. Um, it started as an experiment because the trans people in India were only seen during sex work and uh, begging on the streets. They were not allowed to see on, in a public space or were not safe in a public space apart from these two being a very important reason. And that triggered my thought of starting this as a collaboration with the trans people and the friends that I made with the community. I am cis, and unfortunately, and none of my transgender friends are able to access uh, this kind of an opportunity yet because of language barriers or because they don't have, uh, you know, Zoom, or because they are all busy in a project currently. We are painting several walls across India. We've been really lucky to um, be recognized am amidst so many different artists, uh, especially when we dig deeper into and dive deeper into the history. Um, we have so much to say, but it has been very underexplored in a place like India. Queer histories, for us, like I mentioned, have existed from gods and goddesses' times. And even the name Aravani comes from one such story, which I would like to share. Uh, Aravani Art Project, oh, uh, sorry, the slides can also move a little bit. I forgot to mention that. Um, Aravani Art Project started because there is a festival here in South India which is called the Kutandavar Festival. And this is a festival where there is a congregation of more than 20,000 transgender women 
they meet in this temple to meet the god called aravan and in in one of our epics mahabharata aravan is beheaded after he gets married to a woman basically that's his curse so krishna who's our god he converts himself into a woman and gets married to Ar aravan and the transformation feel that they have the reincarnation of krishna and hence get married to a god here and are called aravani hence i witnessed i got to witness this uh, festival in person and it, it it shook me and it really changed my perspective about a parallel universe that existed in india and it felt like there needed then there was more than just scratching the surface with why we took visual arts uh, we can move to the slides our idea of taking up space in public areas was because india is still stuck in time with regards to how people are viewed at especially the transgender community like i mentioned have always been sexualized and very recently our laws have been passed to even include them in you know uh, making of uh, putting uh, votes and you know including them in governmental jobs it is still been very challenging for transgender people to get job opportunities and slowly now the bigger companies are uh, creating policies where you know uh, gender diversity is compulsory within office spaces but this also is only accessible to a few people from the trans community who are from a privileged background who are able to finish their education arvani art project works with transgender people who have who are specifically in the sex working industry and or are work from very low economic backgrounds where they cannot afford to complete their education or do not receive adequate support from families or friends and they run away from home in a very young age because of the torture that they go through in their families art has become uh, the next slide art had become a very important medium for all of us right now as we are on our 7th year and of our journey um more than anything peop the people or our artists are able to feel safer in public areas feel respected in public areas and feel uh, free to roam around in these public areas and of course this change has been very slow but it has definitely created a very very positive impact which we have observed ourselves when we were on ground painting several walls we can move to the next slide one this was one of our first walls that was created uh, along with seven other transgender women who have never painted walls before and who have never climbed a scaffolding before and it was uh one of our most memorable experiences of learning together uh the design process and uh, the colors are completely inspired by the people from the community and their lives uh they are a big uh uh how do i say they are a big part of creating this they are uh, help us with colors and we all put it together as a form so this was the first time we painted something that had a form as you know before this the images had only shapes so just like a regular art class how we would start with shapes and colors we started with shapes and colors on the wall directly uh you can move to the next image slowly as we started digging deeper into uh, stories and uh, about trans transgender history we realized that they have several religious connotations and several practices within the communities here there there is a community and a cult here as well there are several cults in india as you know india has is so diverse even the transgender community is very diverse each state in india has its own language has its own uh, food has its own dressing and the transgender community also keeps changing in all these spaces so whichever place we are painting in we do take a couple of artists who are trained under us we also collaborate with transgender people who are from that 
geographical area so that we get a very local and a very real understanding of their political economical and cultural strata especially in different states we can move to the next we are exploring different ways of also storytelling because we feel the more stories that are uh, told with related to history with related to facts not just fiction but real life stories uh, feel more connected to people who don't belong to the community and have access to uh, you know or have a bridge to have a conversation and make friends with the people from the transgender community well arvani our project started with the notion of trust and friendship we continue that as a as a very big and a vital part of our growing collective because in friendship there is no ju judgment so in friendship you always accept the person as who they are so we are trying to engage with people through through art and friendship so that we can humanize and make people understand about the community without having them to be a subject or a topic uh we can move to the next slide uh we can move to the next slide our work yesterday today and every day um largely also speaks about yesterday which is the mythological stories which we put together uh as books for of stories that were told and narrated to us by transgender women uh and these stories are about festivals that happen in india about and are for the transgender people of course there is a congregation of cis people also in this in these festivals and that's the beauty and the juxtaposition of this uh we also wanted to compare how transgender people are often looked at as descendants of gods in our country and people often seek blessings from them but at the same time when they are out of that context they are sexualized they are harassed and they are not treated very well so this understanding of both these realities existing together has been a very important study in the yesterday's topic we can move to the next slide the next one today represents uh stories that are relevant now so today is about the past and the present which means we were doing uh, a recording podcasts of transgender individuals who are leading very different lives but also at the same time understanding their background understanding their family so a lot of people in india are very ignorant about how a transgender person leads her life what is her family consists of does she fall in love Do, does she have breakups so you know we wanted to humanize these topics again with the you know larger people who who want who are interested to know more about the community and hence we uh, interviewed six to seven transgender individuals who spoke very genuinely about their lives about today what their life means now what what love means now how their families have accepted them or not have they uh, you know have they have do they have intentions of a future where they can get married where they can get where they can adopt children so we spoke a lot about dreams desires and uh, everything about what they wanted what they want for the future and what they are going through today the next presentation the next one. the next one tomorrow uh is a very important topic where we did uh a lot of gifs that were related to transgender people's reactions to people who are teasing them in a public space uh and these reactions were documented as small animated gifs which we presented uh in india here for one of the exhibits i was not able to put them here because i didn't know if they would work or not but uh we will be releasing it on our website very soon 
and hopefully we can carry that to places to you know showcase that uh, that has been a very very responsive because gif is something that is related to a lot of uh, young adults today and a lot of uh, the younger generation and through the gifs they are also able to learn about certain facts uh, about the transgender community and uh, document also their reactions and how they tend to react to people to such situations so yesterday today and every day in a nutshell the project was about talking about various different uh, comparisons of the past but also how they are linked between each other and how important it is for us to understand that our past is what is giving us a context of what is happening now and what we use to also study the future uh, even with respect to the transgender uh, history uh, we want to touch upon those things only because people need to feel and know that the history had existed before what is happening today because in in, in india if i have to build you a context there our literacy is not 100% we still have a lot of uneducation we have a lot of poverty and people are not so worried about gender as a theme or as a topic because they are still struggling for food and for basic uh, you know realities here so building a con context and spreading the awareness through art uh, was felt very important at our time of existence existence and none and actually a collective like ours does not exist anywhere else uh, in india as well so we were it's not like we wanted to be the first we didn't know because we did not start this with an agenda of becoming famous or becoming uh, you know having too many uh, uh, goals we just took it as one step at a time because of the challenges that we have on ground and we have challenges that exists within the transgender community here there is a lot of history there is a lot of hierarchy within the community and to overcome each and every day uh, steps for that and also taking care of the transgender's mental health on ground especially if they go for sex work creating a safe space for them to share about their stories all of this has also been part of our journey and hence we are feeling very grateful to be recognized at such a forum uh because it's very difficult to do this work in india definitely and without having an agenda of finances uh it has been even more difficult because the indian government now has been very right wing and we have very few chances to overcome this but we will use our history to you know pull pull us up with that i would like to end my uh, session muito obrigado por nima por sua thank you very much por nima for sharing the story of your project with us we would like to congratulate you for the great work that you've been developing Now, to conclude the presentations of this roundtable, we will move to the next speaker, and you can send your question through the chat of YouTube. Now, I'm going to turn over to Felipe San Martin. He is a visual artist, essayist, and also dissident sexual Chilean artist PhD degree in Valencia and he works is from the crossing of the queer criticism archives and the global south he's part is his work is in private collections such as the Sofia Museum in Spain also in museums in the United States Fundacion Nama Unama in Chile among others he's a co-founder of the university collective of sexual dissidents called CUDES from 2002-2019 and author of the book Internet Mon Amour Infecciones Queer Entre lo digital y lo material, published in 2019. Felipe, you have the floor. Welcome. Thank you for your participation. Muchísimas gracias, David. 
Thank you very much, David. First, I would like to thank you for this invitation. It is a pleasure to share this presentation with you. I would like to thank everyone who organized this meeting. I'm really excited to share this with important people such as um, poor Mina from the Aravani Art Project and also Chola Poblete. I would like to share with you a, one of the most recent projects I'm working on. It is called an inexistent archive. And I apologize because I translated some of my slides into Portuguese, but there may be mistakes because I use the automated translation machine. This project is about my interest as an activist and as an artist. I always focus on sexual dissidents based on this technological perspective. So I try to connect these issues with technology and with problems of archives and memory. So this project, An Existing Archive, talks about the creation of a photo archive that relates to sexual dissidents in Latin America, so sexual diversity. It's like a fictional past that took place 100 years ago, and all of that was created using in artificial intelligence tools. So my presentation involves two parts. So the background, so the artistic practice, the research behind it, other pre-existing photographic archives. And there's a second part that relates to a revision of several aspects involved, particularly in this project. First of all, I would like to say that we should talk about activism. This is one of the first influences I've had in my life. For many years, I was fortunate to participate in a collective that it was called Sexual Dissidents um, Collective Group called CUDS that was founded in 2002, so for 19 years, we operated in different um, environments. It's important to say how this activism relates to my project, because activism relates to temporality. We can say that activism relates to the present times in the sense that the what drives activism relates to the lack of staying in the presence where we live. That's the relationship with the current times. So several collectives may fall apart and might feel distance from this inhabitable reality where we coexist. Sometimes activism has to do with the future, transformation towards a better future. That's part of the narrative we see in activism. And oftentimes, especially in activism projects based on the experience from minority groups or experience that have been made invisible, those examples of activism usually feel the need of looking into the past and producing a past that was denied to them. So you need to have this exercise of memory that was once made invisible. All of that relates to my project. We also have some exper interesting experiences that I should mention. For example, I had experience where I was fortunate enough to talk about the memory of sexual dissidents. In this case, for example, I had the opportunity of being part of the project that was called Losing Human Shape. Also, Marika crowd that involved different archives from 
a Latin American, North American collectives that worked in different environments and that created pieces of art that were taken to Allende Museum in 2016. I also participated in the technical Baroque protest at the Foundation La Posta, one of the first manifestations of sexual dissidents in Spain, Latin America in general, and more specifically in Chile. So based on these experiences, we could summarize what were the main conclusions of that, assessing what is the experience of sexual dissidents in the past in Latin America. I can say that this experience of sexual dissidents involved a lot of insecurity, a lot of violence, both on a daily basis as well as in the structure of society. This was determined by a hegemonic heteronormative structure, which prevented legitimate voices in, to be heard, voices in first person. There were no activists there. Most of the archives, most of the documents we see from these minority group examples of the past were built based on the heteronormative perspective. So there is not, the, there's no production of uh, those archives produced in first person said by the people involved in them themselves. There's um, another thesis that was important to me. This has to do with my PhD uh, research related to computer systems that take into account this dissident perspective. I wanted to have a queer genealogy based on algorithms. And in that context, I participated in the residence program in Rio de Janeiro. Maybe you're familiar with that. This is called the Spina Art Center. And there, I worked with a project that investigated the connection between some recent studies that dated, uh, conducted in 2017. Stanford scientific studies where a researcher wanted to launch a neural network that was able to claim to be able to identify the sexual orientation of someone based on pictures from their face. But I made a connection with that with old studies that use anthropometric or biometric data to do exactly the same, but in the past. And I used Leonidio Ribeiro's book that dated back to 1938, another important book in this scientific discourse. Based on these residence program um, of research, there were a lot of activations that stem from that. One of them is shown on the screen. One of them is done last year. This is the first time that I started working with artificial intelligence systems that generated images. On the left-hand side, there's a picture from Leonido Ribeiro's book from 1938. This is a picture from that book. Those are hegemonic pictures, the way the homosexual body is represented. It's a violent, uh, a violated, uh, naked body that has measurement, a measurement scale in the back. So that image was placed in an AI system, and we asked the system to reinterpret that image so that we could have a more positive perspective. And on the right hand side, you can see the pictures that were created by the AI system. That's a new context. It's like they are being resignified. It's like building a new Latin American archive. Based on that image, so based on the first experiment I conducted with the picture from the book, I decided to create an archive with real pictures 
from homosexual couples. So here you have a book called Loving, that's our reference, our example. There was a book that was published in 2020. Why people from the north, usually from elite classes, that in the beginning of the 20th century had access to photography, which was a technology that was not accessible to any, everyone in those days. And here we wanted to create again an archive that was non-existent. I must say that to generate these archives, we needed to generate a minority prompt. La manera en la que un usuario so in that case, a prompt will be the way a user would connect with the computer system. It works as an activator, like a key, an order that you give the system so that it can perform an action. They work like uh, switches, like keys to activate an action. After a lot of trial and error, this prompt was used to generate images according to the images that we had imagined. Based on three, three keys, we developed this work. Non-binary, gay, lesbian, working class, and Latin American people. We wanted to express races, different races as well, with non-white people or colored people. Also, we wanted to create a fiction that is at the same time a technical and a time fiction. The photograph archive simulates a different time 100 years ago and also a technical condition. These are, these look like analog images. And since we evolved over time in the technologies that we use, we also had to take that into account. As in any creation of any archive, we needed a material to support us, but also a technical process to allow these works to come into being. So the denial of archives of sexual dissidents in Latin America is also a material and technological denial. There is another element that is critical in our project that I would like to mention, and it relates to a technical dimension that is very particular to the development of a technology that has not fully uh, developed yet, and therefore there are many errors. And we can see that in the creation of images by artificial intelligence. AI is not fully capable of representing some parts of the human body, for example, our hands. In the case of, these, of this project, these errors by technology was of a lot of interest to me. I don't see those errors as a negative side of the use of these technologies. Rather, I think that they add another layer to our project. At the same time, I think that an error made by an algorithm is an artificial error. And I'm uh, quoting Jose Esteban Munoz. It works as evidence that the images are not real from a ethical and a political standpoint. This project is part of a number of other projects that have created alternative past, alternative histories. Some of them are desirable for minorities. For example, TV shows in which the monarchy is represented by people of color. However, this is an ethical political issue. 
we are here at the risk of erasing our memory and the violence that was perpetrated in the past and that is part of our memory. So I am interested in technological errors because I believe this is a, a type of evidence that these images are fictitious and they do not intend to replace the reality of violence that happened in the past. And those errors are very clear on these images portraying hands with eight fingers and some body parts that are cle clearly not an actual depiction of a real human body. There is another element associated to this. It is an additional element. And it relates to the emotional aspect associated to these images. And this happens to me when I am creating those images. And also when I put together an, exhib uh, an exhibition and I see people's reactions, some images are beautiful, some are quite sad. These are the things that we see when you have pictures that do not show real people when you display AI-generated pictures. Those types of occasions depicted by the uh, pictures were not recorded through photographs. They did exist, but they were not recorded anywhere. They did not exist because the uh, technologies were not so developed. So. Uh, uh, they had not evolved so much. So these are depictions of rare situations that contradict the idea of Roland Barthes, who said that uh, photographs, analog photographs, are like a testimony of the past. They are related to past occasions. They are a testimony of things that no longer exist, but they are evidence of things that existed in the past. Images represent the opposite. And that is why we can see an emotional element here that is rare, that is odd. The emotional reality that is made clear in these images. Here we have a selection of some of those images. These are pictures that were part of our exhibition. This is actually an exhibition that is uh, happening right now in Mexico. And you can see my participation during that exhibition in Mexico. And this was the first time these pictures were exhibited. And this is an exhibit that took place in Santiago, in Chile. And we wanted to present this project so that we had a better understanding of AI and its impact on culture and society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Felipe, for your presentation. Congratulations on the incredible work and congratulations to our speakers. Thank you very much for contributing to our debate. And now I would like to open the floor for questions. And once again, if you want to receive a certificate, you can fill out the form that is available on the chat. You have to register in all of the sessions on the two days to receive the certificate, okay? And I would like to address the panel members now. If you would like to ask questions to other panel members, please, please feel free to do so. It is very important for us to allow you to exchange ideas among yourselves. We received uh, many questions from the audience. I'm going to start uh, with one made uh, 
to La Chola about the definition of Chola. And the question is about the relationship between that word and travesti, which is a word that is very much used in Latin America. It, it was very clear in your speech why you use this term, which is a derogatory term used not only in Argentina, but also in Bolivia, if I'm not mistaken. So, if you could talk a little bit more about the relationship between those two terms, chola and travesti, if they are exchangeable and uh, what is the relationship between the two terms? Thank you. Well, chola, the term, the word chola, is a, a way of expressing the importance of the origins of my grandparents that migrated from Bolivia to Argentina to work. When I was a teenager, it was very, very common. We would hear this word all the time uh, to refer to a person that had indigenous uh, facial features. And since I wanted to be part of the establishment, the uh, hegemony, I did not want to be part of that image until a point where I decided to use that name. At that moment, it was just the uh, name of a piece of work. However, later on, I became that word. Now, if you ask me about my transition, well, uh, my transition happened at the same time as my work transitioned. My career has a lot to do with my transition. I started uh, by desiring that image that I had created, and today I am that image. It is related to my everyday life, which has a lot of struggle, of course, because I occupy a space that is more protected, which is art. But whenever I step outside those protected spaces, uh, the response is quite different. So to be feminine in a patriarchy but not also in patriarchy, in other communities as well, including in the LGBTQAI plus community, it is not easy. There is patriarchy and putocracia, and that is a word that refers to the domination of gay men in the queer uh, theory, and they end up replicating the same mechanisms used by patriarchy and racist and racist societies. But there are also other ways of expressing the feminine. Now, about the term travesti, there is a debate in Argentina and probably in the whole of Latin America, but I'm going to focus on my experience with my uh, friends my fellow activists. Well, there are a number of girls from my generation that are 30 years or older, and they define themselves as travestis. And there's another generation that identifies with the word trans. So I believe there's that difference, the way in which we recognize ourselves. With the image of a woman with prosthetics or a woman that has undergone a number of surgeries. And there's also the concept of travesti, which is more related to the context of sex work in uh, very poor conditions. And that is related to a minority. And it is also related to the women that used their uh, bodies to make money. 
And in Argentina today, there are several laws that are sometimes enforced and sometimes they're not enforced. Well, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I think that's uh, my answer. Otherwise, I would spend a lot more time to continue my answer, but uh, that's it for now. Okay, thank you. Well, we know that these are broad questions uh, that we have to reflect a lot on. But uh, the next question comes from Daniela for, uh, for Mina. And uh, I echo Daniela's words. This is a question that I have too. It is about the how the group engages with the communities to participate in your projects. I would like to know about the strategies that you use. And also, since we're talking about murals and art uh, that is in public spaces, I would like to know about the interactions between the society at large with those works of art. Have people disrespected your art at all, for example, with vandalism or violence against your art? Or is it largely respected and well-received by the public? Thank you. Uh, yes. So with regards to how our participation happens with the different communities, uh, largely, if you see the design or the form that we have used for the artwork are very uh, simple and geometric in nature because it allows people to not feel intimidated and to come and participate uh, while we are painting. Mm -hmm. And especially with people who are not studied art and art in India, uh, art for a long time belonged to a very elitist way of, you know, viewing. It's only viewed in galleries or it's, only on sale for people who can afford it. So the movement of wall painting also started very late in India. And community art was also uh, very recent. And it's been a recent tool in terms of uh, uh, activating people of, from different communities, not just the transgender people. And the whole idea of also for us at Aravani mm -hmm. is for this intersection to happen where the people from the transgender community learn about other communities, interact with migrants, interact with cis women who are, you know, domestic workers or sex workers, um, children, and a, a largely, of course, in a public space, men, cis men. Uh, our experiences during these walls have been very interesting. They can be a lot of stories that can go on for a while, but Mostly, it's about people looking at us disrespectfully first. And by the end of the artwork, they have changed their minds completely about the team or have extreme respect for everybody uh, as artists. And I think the trans women really, really enjoy that because they're not even viewed or are not given that credit because of their gender, but it's because of their, their talent. Uh, so that has been very rewarding. Uh, of course, we have a lot of... Uh, uh, there is There hasn't been vandalism uh, in India. They still don't understand it that much. But there have been situations where they make us feel little. Like they know that you're not powerful. So they they show it to you by just erasing the artwork. That's it. They just whitewash it as something that the government or something that they don't want to see anymore or it's not something that is appealing to them. So those those have happened. And recently we are painting at like some really remote villages uh, here in the northern part of India. And when we had painted, you know, people had spat on it. Not because, again, not that it's to just belittle us but, you know, we always go there and wash it and start painting again. So that also proves or shows a message. We don't have to use words all the time. Uh, it's something that we like to spread about while doing this as well. Because we realized after interacting a lot with the community, uh, all of us realized that there are people in the community who might not want to voice their opinion using words. So we do it through art and mm -hmm. we just 
we don't say much at all we just go we paint and it's, it's been like that for years now yeah Muito, muito, muito bom te ouvir dizer Thank dessa... you very much. It was uh, great to hear you explain how you do things and it brings a whole new dimension to your work. And now this question is to Felipe, but the three of you could answer it, uh, actually, because I can see that there is a very close uh, relationship between your work and the identity that was built historically over time. And uh, all three of you have a deep relationship with time. But this question is addressed specifically to Felipe because he said in the beginning of his speech about how activism is related to time, to the moment you're going through and as a response to an uninhabitable reality, as you said, Felipe. And uh, from your standpoint, Felipe, if you could tell us a little bit more about that relationship with time and the relationship that you had before your activism started and how it has changed after you started working with AI, because This is a futuristic, quote-unquote, uh, situation, but AI is increasingly present in our everyday lives. But at the same time, it is driving us to reflect on the past without forgetting uh, the marks of violence that are still here. So that is my question. I would like to know how you feel uh, the passage of time as an activist and now in your current production. Gracias. Eh, sí, la, la, yo a veces utilizo eh, el concepto de retrofuturismo. I use the concept of retrofuturism. Retrofuturism to talk about some projects that add this tension of temporality of the time. There are a lot of debates as part of critical discussions, as part of activism, that always tries to privilege now, the current time, the moment we're living. Or when people think about the future as an atopic future. But I think that in practice, everything is mixed. The activist temporarily is not organized is disorganized. So we are talking about an exercise that uses a technology that is narrated, is described as a technology that focuses in the future. This is also embedded in some discourses about progress, about the future, about technical progress, about a and not economics, especially non-liberal economics, they're part of this environment and this dynamism, this dynamic system has to do with the neoliberal matrix. There could be others as well, and there are experiments that can try to use technologies to use different dimensions, a different matrix. In the case of the project in Chile, there was a project called Cyber that is being displayed at La Moneda that talks about uh, computer technologies that could also be used for that purpose. So it is possible. And we are talking about a project that uses temporality as, an, as intentional because we use a technology that focuses in the future, but it's a retroactive exercise. So this exercise invites us to think about the past and to rebuild the past in a way that does not is not intended to rewrite the past, but just to bring evidence to something that could not happen in the past. So that's the activist dimension of this project to sh bring to light something that was that for which we have no records of it's interesting to think about childhood under the same light in my experience in the spina there was a workshop about queer 
retrofuturism. And one of the methodologies that we used in that workshop invited the workshop participants to produce a collage a mix of pictures where they will use a picture of themselves as children. So they should take a picture of themselves as a child and that image would be added in a collage of the future. So people should think about a future for themselves and uh, this is the type of exercise that I find very interesting because it breaks the time linearity. Time linearity is built based on power schemes. They are heteronormative, colonial uh, matrices, old matrices, old systems. So that's overall what I wanted to say. I hope that I was able to answer your question. Yes, it was very good. Thank you. Vinicius asks a question to the three of you, and we can follow the sequence of speech, La Chola, Formina, and then Felipe. Vinicius said, in Brazil, we have seen some bids, public and private bids for culture arts, where diversity is an important point that brings more brings a higher score to, and is sometimes even a requirement for those public bids is that the same in your country so do you have funding bids that will appreciate diversity encourage diversity and i myself have a question related to this question all three of you mentioned not only gender diversity sexual orientation diversity but also a racial diversity considering that racism is present in all three contexts that you presented so maybe Flachola can start answering this question, then Permina and then Felipe. Um, bueno, en Argentina sí existen estas este tipo como in the case of Argentina. We get this type of support, so to speak. And, well, a priori, this was kind of contradictory because there were a lot of collectives and artists who did not feel very comfortable with this type of project, with this kind of help, so to speak. They felt that they needed to follow a specific agenda. They needed to cover the points that were listed in that bid. But now I think that there's a new generation that is open to this debate about topics that have always existed, but they were, but in some countries, what happens is that sometimes we choose not to be silent. We choose to express ourselves. In my case, I think it's a little bit contradictory because sometimes I do not want to participate in this institutional-based bids, but I know I have the privilege of being able to share my experience and take my voice in about what goes on and what goes on with people around me. I have the opportunity to do so. As mentioned here by Pranema in the Aravaniar project, I think that most travesty and transgender people in Argentina do not have the tools to access the new laws that exist. In Argentina, for example, there is a quota of work for transgender people. So there could be a safe space, so to speak, in companies 
so that a transgender woman can go and help and go to work. But um, sometimes these people are expelled from home when they are teenagers. And sometimes they cannot even graduate in high school. So some people do not know how to deal with a computer because of that. So it's an interesting uh, initiative to have kind of a quota to hire transgender people. But we need to go deeper into this topic related to offering new tools, related to education, because we see that a lot of people just walk away from those jobs and they go back to the streets. Sometimes they... What happens also is that these people are hired sometimes to positions just to fill the quota, just because it's trendy, just because it's cool. And that person, after a while, is no longer called for other jobs. So it gives us just this illusion the future is going to be better, but that's not exactly how this happens. I understand that, unfortunately, this is also true in Brazil. For me now? Um, with regards to funding opportunities in India, it's getting more and more tough. Um, as you know, our government has stopped or made it very difficult for foreign funds to also come into the country to different organizations. Uh, we have very strict rules now if we have to receive uh, money to even run the organization outside of India. Uh, when it comes to funding uh, opportunities within India, uh, the appreciation for the arts itself is very, very poor here. So, and, and it also belongs to a very elite class in, even now. It, it even makes me feel weird that I have to come and present it here and it's 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 not my colleagues who are from the trans community who are able to access this. Simple things like even checking emails and things like that is not something that is easy for at least the sect of trans women I'm working with. Um, I hope the newer generations are able to understand that, uh, you know, equipping themselves with the basic Education is really important and it's very tough to also reach out to the younger generation because uh, it's not easy to suddenly question their identity at that age when they are having a diaspora at that point of time. So there are a lot of loopholes in a country like India with regards to funding, but there are a lot of opportunities when it comes to commission project and we have been smart to tap that market where wall paintings are required by big institutions or companies uh, just like Lachola mentioned to tick off on their list that this has been diversity inclusive but just because we have come and painted it um, i think it's a tit for tat situation with with regards to our collective we run as a business and as an organization because we realize we cannot exist if we don't run it as a business. So when large institutions call us to come and paint walls and we make sure or we ask them or we uh, spread that awareness about hiring transgender people, not just asking us to come and paint <clears throat> and clicking a few pictures for their presentation. So we are very, very verbal about our choices and you know we are very bold when we tell no to people because they just want us we always ask them why they want us to come and paint or what is the reason behind uh, them inviting us to anything whether it's a gallery whether it's a show without a purer intent because it's important for us as a collective to not feel um, lower than we are already feeling just because somebody else wants it to be ticked off in their boxes. So the opportunities are very competitive also uh, because we are a large collective. Uh, we are not very often called to different festivals 
because they'll have to travel make four or five people travel at least and because i would never want to go to some place without my transgender friends the project is theirs as much as it's everybody's so that also becomes a problem so we are also figuring out ways to make this more compact or make this uh experiences a little more shared or smaller uh, not smaller team but at least for traveling because we don't sh- should not lose opportunities uh we've reduced it to two or three people who get to travel to some projects and then take the help of volunteers so yeah some Perfeito, muito obrigado por That's mim. great, thank you very much, Pramina. Felipe? Perdão, que tira... Que tira agregar... I would just like to make a comment. Yes, go ahead. I also found it interesting to think that in addition to getting funds for a project, I think that mental health is crucial. It is very crucial to follow up the people who start having access to those places that have always been dedicated or uh, to high class or white people. And sometimes the, the people do not have the communication skills required to talk to these other groups. That didn't happen with me personally, but that happens with other people. People feel at a disadvantage in those environments. I try to call my trans, queer, non-binary friends. I try to call them to come with me to be part of projects, not just as work, but also for those bodies to be visible to people so that they were not just talking about diversity we want diversity to be real for people to see trans people occupying spaces it's good when you have an opportunity to travel to other countries as uh, pramina gave the example in india here you can make some changes some changes on your id document for example i'm not sure whether this is allowed in india but when you go to travel for example and you go to the airport and they ask you for your id sometimes it's humiliating because the person who is checking your id or checking you on on the x-ray do not know whether is a woman or a man who should uh, check the person in in the case of an inspection and sometimes people do not want to expose themselves to this type of situation and they just really give up it's very complex but i'm sorry i just wanted to add this point thank you that was a very important point felipe felipe um. Sí, yo, bueno, como, como decía la Chola, yo creo que el... Eh, hay, Chola hay, said, con la cuestión de los, finan- de los financiamientos y las ayudas del Estado... Indeed, la, la contradictoria, there are some que, funding que, sources que, from the state that, and that can be very contradictory, sin, very controversial, because cada caso es una, we are es part una, of this contradiction, but we are not able to fully resolve it. So, in every case, you need to make a decision. In the case of public funds in Chile, for example, I'm under the opinion that I have the opinion that art is a space that allows us to politically use an opening that does not exist in other areas. In Chile, for example, have Fundart, that's an art fund that is now becoming opening to other topics. So it works with several projects, it addresses several issues, and now the new administration has a different initiative that encourages funds to be made not only to artists developing projects, but also to community spaces. So communities themselves can determine the agenda they want to follow. 
So that's a very positive initiative, in my opinion, that makes the spaces more democratic. In addition, if you think about funding sources and diversity, I believe that that can be full of problems. If I think about an activist and my experience as an activist, I realize that sometimes the agenda is an issue. Sometimes there is some criticism about that. Sometimes there are some pockets in, in the institution and through the funding help, they impose what we should do depending on what the company or the institution needs to show to the world. And that's terrible for activists because otherwise activism will be guided by an economic uh, perspective. And that happened in Chile with the Marica activists in the late 90s, for example, all the money that came from HIV related projects created an hegemonic aspect of projects because of the economic interest. This was an agenda that was guided by these economic interests. In this sense, I believe that art allows us to be more open and there are some groups that use it strategically. In Bolivia, they use it in an open way, a tactical way. They use art as funding, as a way to fund their production. I think that's very interesting. I am an artist. I see myself as an artist. I hold a degree in art. I like art, including hegemonic art and conservative art. But I also have that other side. So I believe that we are contradictory as well. When it comes to the word diversity, I also have a quick comment. We use words in a strategic way to assign name to things. In the Chilean con context and probably in Latin America, we should make a distinction between diversity and dissidents because we are talking about policies that are often more hegemonic, more aligned to the establishment, and in other cases, they are more critical. In the beginning of my work as an activist, that was the case. Now it's a little bit different, but we saw that distinction between the two concepts. The concept of diversity is often used as a positive word, and oftentimes it erases the fact that the impossibility of having a diverse world is due to the fact that there is hegemony, which is causing exclusion. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Filippi. We have a question for Lachola. Is there any specific reason why you did not depict the other characters of Botticelli's painting in your work? And uh, do you believe that uh, remakes of paintings like this are necessary for the recognition of dissident identities in contemporary art? Those self-portraits would not only denounce the absence of those identities in the history of art, but also they are a possibility of assigning uh, the name, the uh, title of artist to yourself, since there are not many open spaces in institutions and markets for dissident identities. <laughs> That's a, a big question, very difficult. Well, when I reinterpreted that uh, work of art and others, I was interested in the body. That was what I was questioning at that time. And at that time, I did many performances and I was in the underworld. And that's not so much the case now. 
I was interested in the idea of hegemony and beauty, and I was interested in depicting my uh, naked body. You also asked uh, about uh, Venus, the, the Venus character. Well, I wanted it to be uh, the result of a potato soup. So I wanted to draw that relation between my work and the person who I am. I come from humble origins in Mendoza. And that's why it was so important for me to talk about that. Although uh, the context has changed, my life has changed, it is important for me to go back and think about myself in that place. And uh, you asked another question, I can't quite remember what it was. If you can repeat it, please, that would be great. Well, uh, the question is about how you see yourself as an artist, if that process is related to uh, the way in which you identify yourself as an artist, and if it is a way of uh, self-affirming yourself. That's what I uh, understood from the question. Well, I believe that the concept of what is an artist has changed. It has changed over time. Those pictures were taken in 2012 or 2013, and I did an exhibition with those pictures at a friend's house, and then people started to ask who that person was. And I started uh, to think more about that idea. I was then invited to uh, bring my works to a gallery and an exhibition. So what happened is that I felt that I was in a, con a contradictory space and I didn't quite know if I wanted to be a part of that or not, what uh, type of work I wanted to produce and who I wanted to be. I usually say that my gender is artist. That is the only word that I truly identify with. It is uh, the only label that fits me. The other words, transgender and other identities, well, I think that uh, to feel like those identities, you need to uh, check a few boxes. And I would love to be a shape or a thing that is constantly moving. I want it to be uh, closer uh, to the things that are vital to the world. And not uh, necessarily, I want it to be a person that can only relate to one single picture, one single depiction of what a person can be. So my gender is artist, but that can change as my life has changed. And it all depends on where I am and the moment I'm going through. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to know if you, the three of you, have uh, questions to ask each other. If you would like to ask a question to one of your fellow panel members, please go ahead. Você, vocês estão com, com expressões de que querem. I can see from your faces that you do want to ask questions. Please feel free to, to ask questions. We have 12 minutes left. Pornima, do you want to ask a question? I don't Please have a ahead. question, but I want to definitely collaborate with everybody. And uh, the hope of Aravania project is also for exchanges to happen between transgender people from various cultures to understand each other and to be able to build that solidarity across across the world. And it's art is really a beautiful way to do that. And even like La Chola said, I, I think all the trans women would love to meet La Chola and they would uh, be in sync with what she's saying because they, they have really found a different identity being an artist. And 
more than just being called a trans woman. Uh, so they feel really proud to be artists. And there are days where even I feel very demotivated and not very respected as an artist. And they are the ones who cheer each other up because they feel like otherwise without art, their life would have been way more miserable uh, than it already is. So yes, at any given point of time, you know, we are open for collaborations and um, we, and I feel like we need to learn from each other. And I am so happy to listen to both your works and understand it. I have no questions because we only will get questions when we are together. Muito feliz por essa perspectiva, inclusive. Thank tava... you very much uh, for bringing that perspective. And I was actually thinking uh, how great it would be if we could all be in the same physical space and person and not just virtually, and how those exchanges are so positive. Would you like to make any comments about what Permina said? If not, I have a question for the three of you. And uh, this question is very much related to what you all said and what Purnima said. Um, we can see from your presentations that there is a very deep debate about who we are in this space as identities, as individuals, as human beings. And there are many uh, issues related to those identities. And I think that there are three things that you said that really caught my attention, and I wanted you to elaborate on that. One of them is religion, which is very much present. And religion is very much related to tradition, the past, and also claiming a history, and also the sense of belonging to a certain religion. I think that's very important and that informs the way in which we relate to other people in the world. And oftentimes, uh, queer people are denied their religion. And another thing that you said is related to racial belonging. And the third one is class, social class, your place in the social pyramid. So I wanted to I wanted to hear you talk about those three nuances of identity and how they inform our being as queer people from the perspective of your art, your work. Would like to go first. Bueno, antes que nada, también no tengo preguntas para les don't have questions uh, for, for Nima or Filippi, but I really enjoyed listening to you and of course I would love to collaborate with you. Now about religion, well that's very important to me because when I came out I, I was part of almost every a religion, including the Mormons, because I loved it. And they all try to uh, take out that demon out of me. And I wanted to be in a place where I felt that I belonged. And I wanted to feel embraced and welcome. As time went by, I realized after my oh, Chola virgin uh, works and compositions, I created my own religion. I uh, created my own beliefs based on the symbols, the Christian symbols. I believe that just like religions have evolved, my own religion evolved and any person that 
uh, knows about my life and other uh, dissident queer people will understand what I what I'm saying and I think that they all can relate to my work and I think that's um, extremely interesting you know to be able to establish that dialogue with other people and that's not directed or addressed only to people who can understand the history of art and of course here I am referring to social classes the classes that can access a museum when you're five years old and your parents will take you to the museum, you know, and you don't need to work. So I think that uh, my way of bringing people together, you know, the people that surround me, I think that art is the best way to do that. It is a privilege to be able to use the different symbols and images that I use in my pieces. Now, Felipe, over to you. Sí, para mí la cuestión de la religiosidad, yo creo que yo creo que pasó pasó por una. Well, for me, religion has to do with an experience that many of you probably share with me. It is a more rational uh, matrix. More than a criticism against religion as a hegemonic space. So, the process for me to understand religion in a different way has been a very long process, you know, to understand and see the other non-hegemonic ways of being religious. Religion is not just a power dynamic that, uh, that punishes people. And for me, that process has been absolutely important. And it is related also to stop seeing religion in that way and rather to see it in a different way. My latest projects, my latest works, they are uh, very emotional, the most recent one. And I don't know if I mentioned that d during my presentation, but uh, I don't know if I talked about that when I was sharing the images, but when you click on the images, that's when you see them. And it's very emotional when you get to see those couples in those pictures and you know that they were not actually there they never existed and that is a way for me uh, to think of sexuality not as uh, something that is up in the air and that is very abstract but uh, things that happened in the real world and that uh, depends on a number of factors and I see that i see those images as if they were my ancestors that's how close i feel to those images some of them even uh, remind me of my grandparents i think that uh, relationship is so close and it exists uh, just because i am in a vector that is not isolated i'm not thinking of sexuality social class or race there are many vectors that should be taken into account thank you very much now Purmina, over to you uh when it comes to the context of uh, the three well, different topics that you ao mentioned contexto desses três tópicos que foram mencionados and um, in india it's 
extremely diverse and when i i don't know if i can create a context for uh everybody to understand that but religion has been a playing a very important role from the beginning and now with our present government uh is so right wing we have i mean uh, the how do i say the violence against muslim people have increased largely uh, there's a lot of uh, problems with like smaller christianity and of course the way christianity is spreading amongst a lot of uh, vulnerable tribes in india has been an issue uh through all this uh well in in the trans community um there are specific cults which also follow religion in india uh and the religion is also and these cults are also divided by class so it's very uh, extremely minute these details but they exist in a very very strong way uh there is a lot of casteism in india as well that is still prevalent and you know there are a lot of deaths that happen because of caste uh and gender is something like the last part of the pyramid if you are from a lower caste and from a different gender you are really subjected to something very terrible i think you that person really will be suffering a lot in a country like ours there is this is not in all the places in india india is like i said also one of the most populated so there are several opinions we are a democracy but at the core of it somehow all of these play a very important role suddenly even if they are liberal um there are very few spaces now left for us to actually express what we really feel like a lot of people a comedians or artists are getting arrested because of what they share or what they say a uh, lot of uh, painting shows and art shows have been stopped by government bodies because it's not they, they just term us anti nationals or we are not a, we, are, we are you know doing things against the nation whereas these things exist in our nation but they don't want to believe that so it is definitely uh, extremely challenging especially with the context of queer uh there is a clear evidence of people from the queer community who are from a slightly better religion or a slightly better caste who have the opportunities that people from the lower caste or class don't ever get to experience so the race is something that is kind of okay in india because we have always coexisted but caste and class and religion have suddenly become religion definitely has taken a big huge back step you know i don't know we are just going back in history with regards to that and it's very sad to see that it's happening around us everywhere not just in the main parts of india or something thank you anjum i mean she part listen indeed that's really disheartening well we now run out of time i would like to know if you would like to make any final remarks or thank people and it's important to say that our audience congratulated uh, you and your work through their comments in the chat are very happy that they're able to attend this meeting so would you like to say anything before you, we wrap up the morning session bom uh, okay i would like to thank once again the three of you on behalf of the organizing team so I'd like to thank la chola poblete the eravani art project presented by pranima and felipe rivas san martin i would also like to thank everyone from the masp involved in the seminar the sign language interpreter and the interpreters marilia araña daniela fonseca stella biagetti and maria Gar 
Garcia. I would like to thank VU Studio, responsible for the broadcasting, and we will resume at 2.30 Brazilian time with a second round table discussion with Uwe Brazan and Zeto Metabani, mediated by Daniela Rodriguez. I'm very happy that I was able to mediate this round table. It was a pleasure doing so, and I hope to meet the three of you in other opportunities soon. Thank you very much.
Bom dia, boa tarde, boa noite para Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody, depending on where in the world you are. My name is Daniela Rodriguez. I am the curatorial assistant of public programs at the Museum of São Paulo. Welcome. Welcome if you are watching us online and uh, the replay will be available on our YouTube channel. We are now going to start the second panel in our seminar about queer histories. And I would like to let you know that one of our guests, Joshua, was not able to attend the meeting. So we are going to have two speakers joining us for this panel. After the presentations, we are going to have a Q&A session. So please feel free to type in your questions in the chat. And later, we are also going to make the attendance list available to you in case you want to receive a certificate. In order for us to issue the certificate, you must attend the two days of the seminar and sign in in the three forms of the three panels. This seminar is being broadcast in three languages on our YouTube channel. In one of them, you are going to see the original presentations. You are going to hear the presentations in their original languages. And the other ones are in Portuguese and English. And we also have sign language simultaneous interpretation. So to start the second panel in our seminar, I would like to invite the first speaker, Uwe Bresson. He's going to talk about the coming out of architecture. Uwe studied architecture at the Bauhaus University in Weimar, Germany. He then worked as a research assistant at the German Architecture Museum in Frankfurt. From 20, 2008 to 2017, he was editor and from 17 to 20, deputy editor-in-chief of the German Architecture Journal, AIT. In 2015, he received his PhD in architectural history and historic preservation. Currently, he teaches at both the University of Applied Sciences in Stuttgart and Germany and the Academy of Fine Arts in Munich, Germany. He researches and publishes on 19th and 20th century architecture, as well as on topics of queer architecture. Uwe, thank you very much for accepting our invitation to be here with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here or to be with you. And I will start my presentation with a question. Is architecture gay friendly? This question was asked by the British Architects Journal in 2013. It was the title of a representative survey of almost 300 homosexual architects from all over Great Britain. The participants were asked about their personal experience with homophobia within their professional environment and how they deal with it. The study showed alarmingly that almost half of the participants had been confronted directly or indirectly with homophobic comments in their working environments in the past 12 months. Only three quarters dared to come out in the architecture office. Only one in three dared to do so with clients. And only one in six dared to do so on the construction side. Can you still hear me? Yeah. So these are yes, shocking. Okay, these are shocking figures. But what do they mean? Scientific research shows that homosexual workers who are forced to hide their sexual identity in their jobs are significantly less productive than their colleagues. The constant awareness of not betraying oneself through thoughtless statements or actions ties up enormous energies that are ultimately lacking when focusing on the actual job. It is therefore in the interest of both the employees concerned and their employers that companies create an atmosphere that is open and tolerant towards homosexual. But what does it take? In the accompanying interviews, many of the respondents wished for stronger support against discrimination from both their employers and their professional associations, as well as from public and private institutions within architecture. 
that is from university, museums, and professional media. In this context, participants repeatedly emphasizes the importance of so-called role models within the profession. That is, well-known and successful architects who live their homosexually out and proud. The interviews in the follow-up studies initiated by the Architects' Journal in 2015 and 2017 also pointed in this direction. You have seen the relevant numbers. The result of all three studies. There is a lack of awareness and visibility within architecture of openly gay and lesbian leaders in the past as in the present. Especially for a younger generation, the teen or ghost, the presence of role models is hardly overestimate is from hardly overestimate importance for developing self-confidence and confidently defending one own position within architecture. Comparable studies are lacking for most other countries in the world. However, one may assume that corresponding surveys will probably lead to similar results nearly everywhere both in terms of concrete numbers and with regards to reports on experiences, wishes, and demands of those affected. In this sense, the biographical, the biographical research on homosexual architects should be understood as an essential contribution to the emancipation of current and future generations of gay and lesbian architects. The famous phrase attributed to human rights activist Marion Wright Edelman applies here as well. You can't be what you can't see. The reality, however, is different. Within most architectural studies and biographies, homosexuality is still treated as a stigma that is not even addressed to architects of the past. Yet, the interpretation of an artistic work in the context of the private biography of its creator has long been standard in almost all related art studies. What would we understand, for example, from the art of David Hockney or the music of Peter Tchaikovsky, the films of Vizcino Vizconti or the work of Thomas Mann without the knowledge of their homosexuality? But what has long been standard in other disciplines is still a taboo in architectural history. The homosexuality of architects is often completely ignored, thus accepting the danger of misinterpreting their work. Examples will follow. The most frequently voiced objection against my research places the quality of the architectural design above the question of the person of the designer. The design must be good, everything else is secondary. But is this true? It is remarkable that we hardly ever encountered this objection in connection with the emancipatory self-assertion claims of female architects, which, starting with the anthology Architekten, Ideen, Projekte, Bauten, translating Female Architects, Ideas, Projects, Buildings, published by Verena Dietrich in 1986, do indeed claim for themselves an autonomy within architecture. Already, the corresponding book titles, such as Ways to a Non-Sexist City, Women Architects and Planners in the USA, or How Women Build, Women Architects from Julia Morgan to Zaha Did, or Architecture, a Female Profession, do reveal a clearly separate positioning of female architects within the profession. The fact that homosexual architects also occupy a comparably independent and quite localizable position in the field of architecture is hardly disputed within the US American architectural discourse today. The pioneering role of our colleagues in the US is closely related to the outbreak of the AIDS crisis in the mid-1980s, when the gay disease also found many victims among American, uh, among prominent American architects. One of the first affected by the disease whose death had a lasting impact on the American architectural community was the celebrated New York architect Alan Buxbaum, whose clients included numerous stars of American entertainment industry. His death made it more than clear what impact the disease had and could have in the future on the entire profession. 
Silence was no longer possible at this point. All the way to the New York Times, the architectural world discussed the consequences of the AIDS crisis. Buxbaum, Buxbaum posthumously published monograph, The Mechanics of Taste, was dedicated to the millions of victims of the disease. Buxbaum was followed only a few years later by the New York architectural visionary Roger Ferry, whose studies of green sky skyscrapers seem like blueprints for the bland, overgrown skyscrapers that are being built today primarily in the metropolises of Southeast Asia. Californian architect Frank Israel also fell victim to the disease in the 1990s at the height of his career. At the time, Israel was considered the most promising West Coast architect of his, of his generation, alongside Frank O'Geary, who was his mentor. Unlike in the US, the AIDS deaths in my own country, Germany, were treated discreetly. This also determined how the death of the architect Antoine Laroche from Cologne, who died of AIDS in 1988, was treated. In the 1980s, he was considered one of the most hopeful talents in the country and, like Jeff Wall or Candida Höfer, with whom he was close friends, belonged to the Cologne artist circle of those years. The monograph, published posthumously about him, entitled Innenräume or Interiors, simply states that the architect's life come, came to an end after a serious illness. And so, to this day, it would seem that no German architect has ever died of AIDS. It was different in America. Here, parallel to the increasingly dramatic AIDS crisis, architectural studies began to research the previously taboo history of homosexual architects and to rediscover their sometimes extraordinary significance for the history of architecture. And off it went with a real bang. There is a good deal of evidence, some personal, some architectural, to suggest that Louis Sullivan may have been homosexual. With these words begins the first outing in modern architectural history. They come from a 1986 biography of Louis Sullivan, the uberfather of American architecture. The gradual coming out of American architects reached its climax in 1996, when Philip Johnson, the doyen of American post-war architecture, had himself portrayed for the cover of the well-known gay magazine, Out. In the more than 20 years that have passed since then, scholarly work on the work and biographies of homosexual architects on the North American continent has steadily increased. What all of these works reveal is that homosexual architects have always made and continue to make important contributions to the development of architecture. They thus possess a localizable position within their profession. To elaborate this position and to make it clear by means of examples is part of a comprehensive emancipatory process of making them visible. <clears throat> In the sequel, I would like to point out to you a few more blunders in the biography of architectural studies that should be avoided in the future. So let's talk about the silent biographies. Maybe some of you are familiar with the US architect Paul Rudolf. His main work is considered to be the brutalist art and architecture building at the Yale University. You can see it on the photo. Less well known, however, is his New York penthouse, which the architect occupied for decades and repeatedly redesigned. Here, over a total of 70 levels, the architect staged a unique conundrum of mirror transparent and semi-transparent surfaces and walls. In this way, the architect cleverly disguised the fact that he or hide the fact that his apartment did not contain just one residential unit, but was made up of two penthouse units nested inside one another. For the architect did not live here alone. He lived here with his partner Ernst Wagner. The two apartments were visually connected by sensual details. A glass washstand opened up between the guest toilet and Wagner's living quarters. 
the glass floor of the glass floor of a bath tube in Rudolf's master bedroom was in turn directly above Wagner's bed. Rüdiger Kühnles PhD thesis submitted to the University of Stuttgart in Germany in 2005, unfortunately cannot discover more behind this construction, bed and glass tube. He can only discover an experimental field of light guidance. And over the steadily length of 545, 44 pages, the PhD thesis even manages not to mention Ernst Wagner's name. Ernst Wagner lived together with Paul Rudolph for more than 40 years. Werner Engel, Chen Quen Li's longtime companion, has a similar fate in German architectural history. The letter, you can see him here, is best known for his numerous villas and country houses in the style of organic, organic architecture. Built mostly in the German Southwest and in many cases worthy of a James Bond movie set. That Chen Quen Li loved men and at least since the 1960s went on vacation trips with Werner Engel can easily be gazed from the private photo albums that are now stored in the architecture archive in the Academy of Arts in Berlin. Nevertheless, the 2015 catalog on the work of Lee is silent at this point. In the curriculum vita, where other heroes of architecture history usually like to list marriage, birth of children, divorce, and new living arrangements in minute details, there is no reverence whatsoever to Werner Engel or to a love life as a whole. And the accompanying biographical essay dresses up the subject in the formula, the clients were his family, the houses were his children. The biographer knew better, but he decided, probably out of consideration for social judgment, for an all too readily accepted form of concealment. And while we are on the subject of concealment, I would like to invite you to the chapter on mysterious biographies. At this point, let me introduce you to the architect of the legendary Piazza d'Italia in New Orleans, the postmodern icon Charles Moore. The architect caused an international sensation in the 1960s, not only, not only with his own residential buildings. Here you can see the Moore House his own house in New Haven. His style was playful, eclectic, camp in the best sense, just as Susan Sontag defined the art of homosexual avant-garde in her famous essay, Notes on Camp, in 1964. Moore's biographer, biographers, on the other hand, found it difficult to classify him. In David Littlejohn's biography, we read, In a year of interviews and conversations, I had heard rumors galore, but having essayed them all, I was nearly ready to conclude that Charles Moore had no private life. And Kevin Keim writes, He was a complex man, and those who knew him throughout his life knew him in their own special way. But many felt that they didn't know him entirely. There was always a shade of mystery, another layer to be revealed. Not a word about Moore's homosexuality, which cost him well-paid university positions at the beginning of his career. Instead, twisted word shells and balmy effusions about mystery, mysterious shadows and layers of private life. Biographers and historians are all too willing to ignore the obvious or hide it in cryptic, in cryptic formulas. A common pattern here is the image of the lowly genius who devoted his entire, his entire existence to the architecture and supposedly had no time to lead a private life for all his devotion to the great tasks of architecture. This image is particularly popular in the environment of Catholicism where architects such as Antonio Gaudi or Josje Platznik or Fritz Schumacher are glorified as selfless saints of architecture. 
And while we are at it, we must now also talk about the failed biographies. That is about those architects whose careers would probably have been quite different if their homosexuality, if their homosexuality had not been their undoing in other social circumstances. Join me on Fire Island, a narrow island in upstate New York that became a mecca for New York's gays and lesbians in the 1920s and remains so today. Photographer Tom Bianchi may be considered one of the most outstanding biographers of the island life in the 1970s and 1980s. Architecture plays only a minor role in his photographs, but a whitey one. The island is littered with small but fine masterpieces of modern architecture. Mid-century moderni modernism or mid-century modernity in a variety and quality that we hardly find anywhere else. The architect of all these houses was Horace Gifford, one of the most colorful architectural personalities of the time. It has been handed down that he liked to receive his clients on the beach dressed only in swimming trunks. However, the erotic escapist beach life on Fire Island was also the architect's undoing in 1965, when he was picked up in the dunes of the island during a police raid. The charge was violation of public decency, his crime loitering for immoral purposes. Subsequently, Gifford, Gifford never applied for an official license as an architect, for example, to open his own office. He should have expected his application to be denied at any time because of his criminal record. And so Gifford was dependent on the support of architect's friends throughout his life when dealing with building authorities. Participation in public competitions was hopeless. His career had to be limited to private buildings. The promising career of Frank Lloyd Wright's student Bruce Goff also ended when he had to vacate his university post in, 19, 19, in 1955 because he seemed to endanger the moral of the students entrusted to his care. And there were comparable cases in Germany as well. For example, the well-known teacher of the Braunschweig school, Friedrich Wilhelm Kramer, was picked up by the police in the 1950s in flagranti in a Hamburg hotel room with another man. The Ministry of Education subsequently pursued a disciplinary investigation that should result in Kramer's removal from the university. Only the opposition from his fellow professors and the student body saved Kramer's career at that time. Needless to say that nothing of this episode can be found in the great Kramer monograph from 19, from 2007 by Karin Wilhelm. Also, the process can be traced in the files of the university archives, of course. So, Please understand my talk as an invitation to read architectural history queer, queer reading. That is, to decipher the politically dressed up formulas of biography and to recognize the probable behind the neutralizing shells and to stop bending the truth in favor of what, of what is supposedly socially acceptable. And feel free to take my lecture as a recommendation to buy the book Gay Architects, Silent Biographies from the 19th, from the 18th to the 20th century. It is available in well-stocked bookstores since July last year. It was produced in recent years together with Wolfgang Vogt of the German Architecture Museum and contains almost 3,000 silent, mysterious and failed architects' biographies from the last three centuries. Parallel to the book, the exhibition The Coming Out of Architecture was also created, which also lent its title to my little lecture today. It was commissioned and supported by the Association of German Architects, 
Opened as part of the Bright Festival in Stuttgart, a city is in the south of, of Germany, the exhibition wanted to set an example by offering a stage for queer positions within architecture for the first time in Germany. It was the first architecture exhibition on that subject conceived in Germany and shown here. The gallery of the Association of German Architects was therefore temporarily transformed into a queer space. On display were works by the anonymous architecture collective, the Queer Architect, which has been making a name for itself for several years on the social media platform Instagram. And yes, the works on display are provocative. They deconstruct architectural history and establish new perspectives. In the process of queering, as the anonymous actors themselves describe their working method, new readings are inscribed in architecture, meanings are shifted, and knowledge is reconstructed. Through clever montage, an alternative reality is depicted that cheekily, playfully, and self-confidently asserts a different a queer architectural history. Iconic architectures and architectural drawings are alienated and enriched with new material. Unexpected visitors, gay style icons, butchers, dykes, ladyboys and shemales populate the architecture. The work generates new approaches and perspectives that oppose the heteronormative architectural discourse. The exhibition in which these works were shown thus also took on a task of representation. It has taken the perspective of LGBTIQs seriously and stood late and translated it into its own imaginative exhibition world, thus making their presence visible within architecture, confident, proud, and sexy. I think we need much more of this in the future. Thank you very much. Muito obrigada, Uwe. É super interessante seu tema de Thank pesquisa. Thank you, Uwe. This is a very interesting field of research. It made me think about a research topic I'm addressing today that deals not specifically on homosexuality in architecture, but in modernist literature in Brazil. So that's inspiring to me. Now I am going to give the floor to our second speaker, and after she finishes, we can open for a moment of discussion. So feel free to send your questions using the chat. And now we are going to hear the words of Zetu Matebeni. Her title is non gegen doda on the intersection between arts and queerness. She is a researcher in South Africa in sexuality, gender and queer studies. And she contributed significantly for the queer studies in Africa with the publication of seven books and also poems, as well as presence in films and exhibits. So thank you very much, Situ, for accepting our invitation. It is a pleasure to meet you and to spend the afternoon with you. The floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, Daniela, for the introduction. Um, I'd also like to thank Ana Souza uh, for the invitation to the seminar, um, David Ribeiro, Andre Mesquita, Carlos Enrique for the support um, and assistance. Um, the title of uh, my presentation, which I will read out, is Nonga Yindota. I will repeat the phrase Nonga Yindota. And it is on the intersection between arts and queerness. So um, there will be a lot of um, uh, non English words spoken in the presentation. So non gaindota is a Kosa term. Um, and I'll keep repeating it. Western terminologies continue to overshadow local realities and interpretations of sex and gender diversities in many, in many colonized nations. 
These terminologies pose a challenge, particularly for gender and sexual diversity, as they are often regarded as Western, even when adopted into local contexts. Within the African context, it has been African leaders who have consistently claimed that homosexuality is a Western concept, and thus denying those identifying as gay, lesbian, and even transgender an opportunity to claim Africanness. This denial of existence is, however, contrary to the diversity of the African continent, its people, and its rich histories of genders and sexual freedoms. The proliferation of Western terminologies has contributed to African people reflecting and representing themselves in borrowed terms. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, and queer are more familiar and widely circulated than Yandaudu, Ashtime, Atandara, Gojigen, Supi, or Kuchu. These local terminologies did not limit experiences of those who practiced or were named as such to what we now have as LGBTIQ and its ever-expanding acronym, which also includes a sexual to spirit in some contexts and the plus sign referring to other allies. It can be argued that with the expansion and use of the acronym came the loss of local and culturally specific forms of association and naming. At the same time, LGBTIQ plus has gained momentum and has been used as an organizing and advocacy tool for claiming rights in Africa and many parts of the world. Yet the term itself remains contentious because of its Euro-American influences in activist struggles and circles, and also its link to international donor agencies. A critique of Western languages and gender relations is that these have packaged African existence in dichotomies, limiting diverse experiences and expressions. This is linked to co the coloniality of gender and thinking of gender only as binary. Similarly, careless translations of Western terms into single words in other contexts have also shown the limits and power of language. These translations can distort history and reality. Thus, what is demanded is the resistance to misinterpretations, heteronormativity, and patriarchal dominance of historical events and traditions. It has also become clear that in African countries, verbal language has been used as, back, as black, backlash and as forms of excluding sexual and gender non-conforming persons. One of the challenges that the gender and sex order faces currently is the rigid binary brought by Christian colonialism, which polices and legislates what and who is deemed outside of the normal, in inverted commas, and thus furthest from the image of God. The versions of what is regarded as normal have changed over time. While we cannot undo the effects of colonial conquests on African bodies and beings, it remains possible to continue pushing against regulatory regimes that map all bodies against a limited normative framework. What I'm presenting today is work in progress that I've been developing on ways of queerness in Africa, paying particular attention to African terms and concepts that express fluidity and diversity in the African context. In developing existing work on the concept Nonga Indota, I move away from the focus on gender 
and argue for a version of existence that is non-tangible. To do this, I make use of two Black South African artists, visual and sound artist, Ati Patrahuga, or as some people would call Ruga, and poet in terms of Gazi Their respective works on Nonga Indoda illuminate a queer aesthetic that simultaneously negates and affirms the possibilities of being in and out of existence. So, Nonga Indoda revisited. In previous work, which was published on the concept Nonga Indoda, I deployed the term Unonga Indoda, a term I traced to be used popularly among Nguni speaking people to refer to masculine women or men like women. And I make this explanation to show that the word itself is a completion of many other things. So um, the suffix ndoda comes from the word indoda, which is a man in his Tosa and Isi Zulu languages. And the joining phrase ngai or ngai would refer to something we could say could be like or similar to or would be. And the prefix uno or u in a name is used to demarcate the sex of the person at birth. And usually it refers to female. So for example, in a, a, a girl's name, a girl would be named no sipo with the prefix no, meaning um, a gift or nonche uh, with the prefix no, meaning um, the beautiful one. While u no ngayindoda could refer to people who could be male physically, socially, and culturally, as explored, as I explored in previous work, in some contexts, it has been assumed to relate only to women who have chosen not to have relations with men, women in same-sex relationships, lesbian women, or women whose lives are not limited to heterosexual lifestyles. As I explored in earlier work, Unonga Indoda is linked to social standing. And that basically means offering the person named as such a status not easily granted to anyone. In such cases, Unonga Indoda becomes an achieved status or position, suggesting that one can become Unonga Indoda through actions, accomplishments, or certain forms of success. In such cases, others would name the person Unonga Indod, implying a recognition of the successful accomplishment or attainment of such status. This success and status does not suggest class mobility. Rather, it focuses on social and cultural inclusion. In earlier work, Unonga Indoda appeared to be granted the name, uh, Unonga Indoda appeared to be granted the name as a form of recognition. So in some cases, being associated with one's father or looking like one's father or the social standing of one's father would be given to that person named Unonga Indoda. At the same time, this may not be limited to biological parenthood, as many people are known to be raised by extended family members. In the second instance, the term can also be strategically used as a powerful way to, atta to attain freedom and thus escaping abuse. In this sense, Although Unonga Indoda may be used reproachfully by others, as shown in a text that I looked at by Dazela, those to whom the term applies can redeploy it 
or redeploy its use or reclaim it as a tool to fight back against such denial and abuse. In this context, although Unonga and Oda is used pejoratively, similarly to queer or slut in other contexts, it can be reclaimed. Its usefulness to those who reappropriate it can give them power to fight back against injury, the injury and harm caused. This is a form of repurposing language as a protest and resistance. Furthermore, Unonga and Oda can be deployed as a disruption to the binary that is often set out in existing versions of the term. So, so far as I've presented, Nonga and Oda has appeared as a term denoting men or women in regards to their belonging or not belonging. Gender identity has not been interrogated through this term, but rather overlooked. In this third version of Nonga and Oda, uh, I looked at Nicholas, another artist, Nicholas uh, Shobo's work, who also used the term Nonga and Oda to refer to his artwork. And in that work, the term appeared to interrogate and transcend gender through textile material, so to speak. So to speak. Using free, flow, free flowing and light materials stitched together with rubber, the artist, Nicolas Sobo, presented a drag figure familiar in queer culture. Staging Unonga and Oda through drag materiality, the artist expanded the fluidity, bending and blending of Unonga and Oda. And so in the next sections, I develop this idea through two other artists' work. And I further expand Nonga and Oda to hint towards its elusiveness, a strategy which in further work, I will argue as essential for African existence in an increasingly anti-gender moment. Nongai Ngai. Titled in Isitosa, Ati Patra Huga's woven tapestry on canvas, Umutakauli Buga Nongai Ndota and Mtunzikazi A. Mbungwana's poem, Unonga and Oda, are both entry points to this expansion of the concept Nonga and Oda. So I'll repeat again those titles. Ubu Kakauli Buga Nonga and Oda and Unonga and Oda. The artist's choice of language in titling their works is significant in reclaiming local epistemologies. Both artists demand that the viewer or reader interrogate their path and sense of knowing. What is conjured up when reading the what is conjured up when reading the title Unonga and Oda? As you're listening to me, what are you hearing? What histories? are erased, silenced, and forgotten in reading this title? And what ways of knowing are resurfaced in the use of the title? What do these titles tell us about the artists Ati Patra Ruga and Mtunzigazi E Mbungwana? What both artists are set entitling their work in this way is in the first instance, guarding against translatability and mistranslation. So both titles are methods of knowing that demands deep inquiry. As noted above, 
There are no simple and easy and easy translations of Unongai Ndota to English. That the, co that the concept expands and surpasses binary forms of thinking and ordering is a challenge to Western forms of knowledge making. Both artists are Tosa speaking and both are queer, self-identifying in different ways. Their individual works are both personal political and also so socio-political. Ati Patra Khugaz Ubukatauli Nongandoda is a portrait of wool and thread on tapest tapestry canvas. Vertical threads make the backdrop of the portrait. The middle ones in multi colors of pink, orange, green, and blue, and the side borders in black and gray threading. The face and head of the artist is adorned with what could be a golden neck turban and a multicolored crown going in all directions. The body is adorned in a red coat with circular embroidery, resembling a, si a sun with white rays. The artist has a mustache and the almost pouted lips are red. The eyes are wide open and side glaring at the viewer. The portrait could be that of black royalty. It is, however, unusual as it does not rely on any visual cues. This defamiliarizing is the insistence that the artist brings into the title Ubukakawuli Bukanonga Indota. As already explored, Nonga Indota is an unsettling category. Moreover, in this specific artwork, it is not clear exactly at what the viewer is looking. Is this a God figure, given the specific reference to Nonga Indota's glory? What happens to us when we imagine Nonga Indota with such splendor, with the same glory of God? The artist's strategy here is significant. Through the use of language, the artist takes risks and challenges the viewer to disregard already existing notions about godliness. By presenting the glory of Unonga and Dota, the artist specifically removes any gendered associations of Nonga and Dota, as it is the glory and radiance of Nonga and Dota that is central rather than being a god or being God, a figure often associated with maleness. Ntunzigazi Mbungwana's poem titled Unonga Indod chronologically traces Unonga Indoda starting from birth. The beginning of the poem makes the assertion of not locating Nonga Indoda in any gender terms. The poet starts, or the poem starts in this way, and I will read in his Tosa. Unonga indota akamtu yinto akayondombi engengomfazi engeyondota kunonga indota. In the middle of the poem, or in the middle, the poem comments on the roles that nonga indota plays in society. In the crowd, those in African context would know what a kraal is, a place demarcated mostly for men, in the cooking house with women, at work, and returns to how Nonga Indoda was raised and in growing up. 
These are not easy associations. And the device the poet uses is a critical lens to affirm and simultaneously distance Nonga and Dota from these situations. As the poem ends, the reader sees a circular motif used where the poem returns, or the poet herself returns to the starting place, asserting the follower. And I read it again. Unonga and Dota, Akam, Yindo. So, there are no conclusions here. As I said, this is work in progress. What I'm working towards is thinking through the possibility of Nonga and Dota as an elusive term. On the one hand, Ati Patra Huga presents Nonga and Dota in, this place, in the space of glory. On the other, Ntunziga Zimbungwana offers a critical reading of Nonga and Dota as not human, but a thing, Indo. What nature of a thing is Nonga and Dota? Can Nonga and Dota, as Patra Huga suggests, be a thing of glory? This is where languaging or language of these works leaves us. Unonga and Dota cannot be conclusively defined through language. Its slipperiness and elusive qualities that are, are slightly out of grasp is what makes the category fascinating. It is defamiliarizing in its form, shape, and character. What makes Nonga and Dota alluring is its opening up of Black queer and queerness that works not with gender, but works at the site that recalls local epistemologies. Could Nonga and Dota be what we have been waiting for? Thank you for your attention. Muito obrigada, Zetu. Eh, Thank you muito... very much, Zetu. Your speech was extremely interesting, and I believe that it shakes a little bit of the structures and the categories and also how the Western language uh, intends to be universal. So thank you very much for that provocation. Well, for all of us watching us, feel free to ask questions in the chat. You can also send comments, your thoughts based on the two speeches. And also, Uva Izetu, if you would like to ask each other questions, please feel free to do so. We're here to offer you that opportunity as well. But uh, I have one first question that was submitted in the chat, coming from Andre. His question is, well, uh, I was thinking about the idea of Nonga Indoda and how it is reaching queer activism beyond theory, but also in relation to social change actions. So maybe we could start uh, talking about that and then we are going to go to the next questions. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you, Andre, for that question. Um, and yes, actually, uh, as I'm developing this work, the whole idea was to actually develop uh, the notion of the concept of non and order for queer activism, particularly within the African context. Um, and one of the reasons why I started working with this was um, the difficulties in which we, as, as activists in, in Africa in particular, we found ourselves at a crossroads with um, ways of um, supposedly and, uh, being understood um, and included within um, the local framework or the African framework because of, you know, of, um, of these Western terminologies and how even as activists we've deployed them to to mean that we we do not belong within um, 
the African context. And so there are many other terms um, that uh, could be developed uh, or be resurfaced. So in the first instance, my interest is to resurface the term because many people had stopped using it, um, particularly activists, because uh, Western, Western thought made us believe that it was only a derogatory term. And so through, uh, through this deep reading uh, and reading intertextually, what I've tried to show is that actually we can, uh, we can now challenge this Western idea of this Western thought that has made us think that we should be so distant from terms that can actually describe a whole range of being um, that cannot be contained within the Western thinking. So, so the, first, the first level is to resurface the term. Um, if, you, if you ask many activists, they probably wouldn't use it uh, because they still associate it with being a derogatory term. So how do you resurface the term and bring it back into popular, um, popular culture and in conversation for people to, to start using it and uh, reappropriating it and reclaiming it um, in ways that don't only talk about, you know, um, talk about LGBT, but in, in ways that expand even the LGBT lexicon. Because what we see in activism is that even that LGBT is actually quite problematic. And of course, we've known that, for example, trans issues have always been sidelined within lesbian and gay um, movements or issues um, the aren't commonality of, um, of issues and struggles, etc. I mean, I'm sure you know the, the issues that are happening within um, LGBT um, activism. So, um, so using, using the term would then also start saying, okay, so if we start from using this term, is it necessary to abandon uh, LGBT, uh, LGBTIAQ+, uh, and start thinking through uh, these different ways of being that are much more localized and bring new understandings and epistemologies from, the, from our context? Or can we use them side by side? Uh, and what would be the risks and what would the challenges there? And I think that is a conversation that would need to be ongoing and be quite reflective, even in, in activist circles, to say, you know, what have been, what have been the gains of, uh, of, of, of the LGBTIA plus Q lexicon, but also what have been its challenges and what middle ground, if necessary, could be used? And would it be useful to now start deploying concepts and terms such as nonga and order, and to what effect. So yeah, that, that work is work in progress. And so thank you very much. But if you have ideas, I would like to hear also from, from you. A gente poderia aproveitar esse momento para ver se a gente consegue. Well, we could take this moment uh, to try and think of a few ideas. Uh, but uh, Zeto, even when I was reading the description of your presentation today, I uh, tried to understand the term from the Western globalizing perspective. Try trying to understand. I was reading it as non-gain or non-gays in Dota, as if Dota was a place, you know? So I was lost in translation. I was trying to translate the term. And of course, language uh, can go just so far. And I thought that the idea of reclaiming the local term is very interesting, considering, you know, that global exercise of trying to uh, fit things in specific categories. So uh, I apologize for the way I pronounced the term and how I was reading the concept. And thank you very much for clarifying the meaning of the term. And now uh, I have one question for Uva. 
Uva, do you think that uh, the coming out of architecture can help us uh, find a different way of living and occupying spaces? I don't think you talked too much about that in your speech. If you could elaborate on that, that would be great. Yeah, so <clears throat> it's it's a, it could be another lecture to to talk about this topic. Of course, we we can learn from from other kinds of of living together. So, uh, gay couples or lesbian couples or rebels, whatever, they have other modes of living together than a family. So, if you think a family, you know, a family house and. There are a master bedroom and there are children bedroom and all these things. And uh, in other yeah, living experiences from gay couples or lesbian couples or queer couples, you you need other rooms. Uh, you need an other other floor plans. And sometimes these these other floor plans are more interesting also for the for the for the traditional family so when we look at the 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 history of architecture the, the 20th century there are many modern iconic buildings so i don't know if you, if you know architecture history a lot but but there are really important buildings in the in the 20th century that are famous now and nobody knows who are the clients or we, we know who are the clients but we don't talk about the clients very often but we can see that many of these icons were built for 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 clients that were not in the heterosexual norm so for example Edith Farnsworth in America she she built a house with with the architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe and it's one of the of the most iconic buildings of the 20th century uh, of the 20th century and this this uh, Edith Farnsworth she was a single woman a single woman in 1950s america it was untypical to live alone as a woman and to own her own money and uh, she needed no man, and uh, sometimes she she lived together with with a girlfriend or with other women, and she built a house that was you can't use it as a family, or it's 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 only for her, and it's totally open. There's only the the, the bathroom is the only closed room in this house. The the other the all walls are out of class and you can look through the house and and this is this is an, an icon today but it was built for an, for a very special client and so I, I think we we can learn a lot from these these special clients and the the houses they they built for for another way of living than the than the typical or traditional family life so yes, we, we 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 can learn a lot from if we really look at architectural history and don't look only at the at the at the final works. So in, in, in architectural history, normally my students they they look at the at the finished building. So there's this Farnsworth house and they look at it and they, oh, that's it's beautiful and it's uh, full of, out of class and it's an open floor plan. But we have to understand in architectural history that it needed a special client for this. So that that we can that we made this this enormous step in in architectural history or in in, in yeah that, that, that this icon was built. So it's uh, it's part of the history to look after the lives of the clients and to have a deeper look than just to see the form or the material or the construction of the architecture. Maybe this is an answer. I think so. Yes, it answers my question. 
we could discuss this for a longer period of time. But let me ask something else. I was trying to find some points of commonality between your speeches. So we've talked about some central connections and how architecture can show a different perspective, something that is not normative, based on the way these architects found different ways of building some spaces, such as the connection between the bathroom of one person and the other person, as in the example of the couple you mentioned. So we can find changes in architectonic constructions that denotes some perceptions and, and diversity in the sexuality of architects or their clients. So, Uwe, when you look into the biographies of these architects, oftentimes there are mysterious biographies as you described them. How can fictionality or how can our interpretation of the lives of an architect can be determined? So how can you find traces or signs of what is not being said in this hidden mysterious biographies, but then you can find this maybe in architectonic traces. Do you also find information about those architects in other, in other sources, in other areas? So, <laughs> so well, in the, in the past, uh, there were no photographs. We we have no, and we have no love letters of these architects. We know it just from from traces. So, when when architects live alone or they live together with their mother or their sister for their whole life, and then we we can we can say oh maybe there 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 is a point so it's it's a sign for for their homosexuality but but it's always traces and and sometimes these the 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 the, the architects are dead and one of their relatives or a good friend is starts to talk about it that there was maybe a homosexuality, and at this point we we start with our uh, with our research and try to find more hints or uh, more points that uh, that goes in 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 that direction. And then finally we we look at how do they live, uh, how how do the buildings where the architects live, how do they how do they look like. Because you you can see in the in the in the houses or in the rooms, in the environments that were used by by gay people, you or by by queer people, you you can my my idea is you can see or you can feel when you are in a in a in a in a living room of a of an of a queer people, you can see it somehow. There are signs of it. Uh, maybe there are a different kind of books or there are different kind of uh, paintings of photographs on the wall so that you, in, in the most uh, queer households you, you can find something that directs on on uh, on this queerness of the people living there and it's also in the past that, that you can see in in floor plans <clears throat> how people lived or how people lived together. So in this, uh, may, maybe this is um, some, uh, a part of, of, of my research to, to find the, the little, the, when, you, when you look at, at floor plans from the past, uh, you, you can see, oh, this, this is not a real, it's not a family house. Because the rooms are too open and there is no children room, and then you understand. Oh, if the if the if the floor plan of the house is is not for a family, then they then they must have lived someone else, and uh, a queer person or a queer couple. 
So this, this is um, part of my research or how I understand it, what I do. And it, it's, so I've, I've talked about the, the other art histories, uh, literature, um, painting, music history. Uh, everybody can talk about uh, gay artists uh, openly, but in, in architecture, it's still a taboo and nobody wants to talk about it. And this is, for me, it's something strange. And it's not, it's not activism, but it's, uh, it's my little field where I may be part of activism to, to open my profession to a more diverse thinking. Sim, e se, e se a gente for pensar as casas... And uh, if we come to think of standard heteronormative houses, they usually reproduce the pattern of a traditional family. So the whole house structure mirrors that society. Indeed, if we observe the changes that have been made in a given space, we might find different identities there that go beyond the heteronormative standard that will determine the spatial distribution of a house. I can make a direct relationship with what Zetu mentioned about language language as protest, as resistance, but also a way of disturbing a binary world. And I think that architecture can also uh, disturb heteronormativity and disrupt it, as Zetu mentioned, talking about reclaiming local terms and using local terms that are more specific. So, Zetu, I would like you to comment on these subtle perceptions of other identities based on the use of language can, that can be used as protest, as disrupting this uh, binarism. How do you see that in the artists that you analyze and that you study in your research? Yeah, thanks, Daniela. Nice question. Uh, well, both artists actually, uh, uh, they've been uh, invested in this project of uh, destabilizing um, and breaking down binaries. So for example, Ati, Ati Patra Huga's work um, a while back, uh, they did a series um, called The White Women of Azania, The Future White Women of Azania. And, um, and I mean, this, <laughs> in, the, in the series, there were no white women, <laughs> um, which is also quite a very important commentary, especially in the South African context. But also uh, titling that to think about... Uh, white women in Azania. And Azania is, uh, is, is, is basically the, the decolonial uh, imagination of, uh, of Africa. Yeah? And so to locate the future white women in Azania was also a kind of a disruption. But actually in the artworks, there weren't any. And, and that was an important thing. So... The disruption can happen in so many different ways. Um, and this breaking of the binary can make happen in so many different ways. I don't think it's, it's not only about sexuality or gender identity, but within, within the South African context, it's also about race and it's also about class. And I think all those um, intersections are, are, are really important. Um, similarly, so for example, uh, the other artist, Mtuzi Gazi Bungwana, also, um, I mean, their current project is actually thinking about um, ways in which other writers have disrupted, um, have disrupted language by recreating um, different ways of, uh, of talking, particularly about lesbian women, 
um, black lesbian women um, and seeing what other figures come up when, when, when you think beyond not only the, link, the English language, but when you, when, when you think beyond notions of desire, um, love, homemaking, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you can see this in, in, in also a range of other works which aren't necessarily art. Activists, um, um, as it was asked earlier, activists have also created different, um, different ways of disrupting um, um, language. So for example, the East African term kuchu, um, uh, at some point or earlier on, it was used mostly by uh, gender non-conforming and sexual non-conforming persons. Um, and it became a language that is used, I mean, that is known within those circles and activist circles. But of course now with, you know, <laughs> um, uh, with the interest in, 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 in issues around sexuality and gender identity, particularly in East Africa and Uganda and Kenya, the word has become known. Um, and even you find that even parliamentarians, when, when they were debating, for example, the anti-homosexuality bill in Uganda, were using the term kuchu, uh, perhaps not even knowing its full context, how it comes up, but only associating it to what they see as homosexuality. But the term itself was um, encompassing of many other diversities. Um, also, I mean, uh, I've also been looking at many other terms uh, that can be used uh, and also terms, terms that can travel, uh, travel particularly from the global south into, uh, into the north. Uh, and I think that flow is an important disruption because what we've seen um, is that a lot of knowledge is created in the north and comes to the global south and we take it as something that makes sense to us. But <clears throat> in focusing now on, on what is happening in the global south, we can not only change that direction, but also um, make insistence of saying, well, your world is not sufficient in explaining who we are. And so we, you know, we are creating this vastness um, and perhaps you may fit in, and perhaps you won't understand us, but this is what we are offering. Yeah. I have a question. What, what would be a good term that, that comes from the south and goes up to the north so that, that we can work with in, 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 the, in the north? Mm. <laughs> nice, nice question. Now you see, okay, I, I don't want to get into my other work, uh, but the term I've been working on uh, now um, is Dalasi. Dalasi. It's easy, Dalasi. Yeah, it's easy to say. Uh, and uh, and in the next, when when Matt, Matt invites me again, I will unpack it. <laughs> 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 but you will find it in many parts you will find the actual word in many parts of the world but it has different uh it has different meanings and so when we unpack it from the global south as it moves it will come with a different kind of force um and vigor and um and i and i and i think the rest of the world will take it the lassi seems easier than the, the word you described in your lecture. All the time I tried to, to, to speak it, but it's impossible. <laughs> yeah, so I will offer Dalassi next and then we'll see what we can do with it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks. Dalassi. I will remember yeah. this. Yeah. <laughs> It's much easier the Anonga Yendoda. I am glad that you also exchanged questions uh, between yourselves. Great. There is another question here that 
relates to what you said before the two. That's Carlos' questions. He says, when we think about non gang in Doda as a decolonializing movement as part of the queer experience, it is similar to the concept of a travesty, travesty mm. that thinks of a, a, a freer way that looks to ancestral references, because th that's the relationship he made with the concept of travesty in Brazil, and he would like you to comment on how that relates to South Africa. Okay. Yes, that's wonderful, Carlos, uh, and I'm glad you're raising travesty, uh, <clears throat> and and it and it's so applicable actually in this particular uh, piece and uh, this work because actually the artist Ati Patraruga actually uses uh, the type uses travesty as one of um, as one of um, their exhibitions um, as a um, uh, yeah a collection of works um, and is focusing specifically on this. Uh, and I mean, I, as, you know, as, as you are aware, travesty has a particular context and a particular location. Um, there are some similarities in the, in the Southern African context, in the South African context. And one other artist who I'm looking at, uh, who's a musician actually, um, uses a different kind, a different kind of, a, a different genre of travesty. Uh, and calls it transcandi, uh, and and transcandi is a blending and a version of um, of music that is created by non-conforming beings, black non-conforming beings, who um, who claim a particular regional location, um, and and. And they come up with this kind of genre of music, uh, which isn't necessarily widely circulated, but the naming of it uh, is so significant because it gives it gives context in the location of a place. And so, and so I think we can read um, read these two shifts and movements together, um, not necessarily comparatively, but to say that these are the shifts that are happening you know, in different locales in the global south. And what can we do with them? So on the one hand, you have travesti. On the other, you have transcandi. Or, yeah, transcandi. And what, what, what does this open up um, when, you, when, when you move with these two ideas together? So for me, that, yeah, I think that would be a, a, a generative concept rather than just taking it, taking one and say, OK, um, it's applicable here. Um, and let's see what it does. But how, 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 how does it help us resurface what else exists and, and then have the conversation along those two? Thank you, Zato. There's another comment about what Uva said by Caio. And I think that after addressing his uh, comment, we can talk about urbanism. If we expand the idea of architecture and space to urban environments, uh, cities and public squares, we can see the impact of uh, those concepts in these spaces where LGBTQIA plus bodies are always in dark places. They are always silent in our cities. So Uva, I would like you to elaborate on that comment and ask you if you also research urbanism and the relationships between the different spaces in cities. Yeah, yeah, of course. And to the, I, I like the comment because of the of the dark spaces the the, the questioner asks for, and of course, since 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 uh, since ever, gay men meet in dark rooms. Uh, it's it's part of, of 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 our sexuality, and maybe today it's uh, at least in Europe it's it's part of our fetish. That we meet in in dark corners, in in dark rooms, in and it's it's part of the history. We in the the, the last hundred years, 
um, it was forbidden to, to be openly gay and uh, the dark corners of a city or the parks were the only public places to mingle, to, to meet each other. So and we so from the from the parks or from public places that are a little bit hidden in the city, gays, especially gays, used these 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 architecture and built it inside their own um, uh, own bars, own restaurants. Also, also gay bars, gay restaurants, gay uh, gay clubs, gay saunas. They're all a little bit dark and um, like <clears throat> labyrinths to where you can get lost. A little bit like like a, a city or a, a dark area of a city. And yeah, it's it's <clears throat> it comes because of of the of the the, the gays had to, had to be afraid of the of the of the rest of the of the society so gays were beaten they were uh, uh, followed up they were imprisoned for for being homosexual and so this is maybe still inside this culture uh, to hide and to 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 use dark corners and the most cities are still working on it at least in, in, in Europe to or oh, it's, it's it's a global a global phenomenon um cities are still interested in destroying these places so the the last time it was here in in, in Germany there was a public park where gay guys meet in the afternoon or in the in the early evening and this it was a park uh, not well cleaned uh, many many bushes many trees um, so that there existed spaces where you can hide if you if you meet someone and you want to to go a little bit further then you can hide in the bushes or in the in, in the narrow parkways and the city was not happy with this and so the city cleaned up this park they destroyed all the bushes uh, now you can see 200 meters uh, wide and everything is open and the gay guys are are gone now uh, the the official the official official uh, explanation from the city was um, there were too many rabbits in the in the park so they had to destroy the these um, these bushes because of the of the rabbits so it, it's it's somehow funny for me to to, to read such things in, in newspapers and yeah we we like every other group in the city that is non-white that is uh, non-heterosexual that is uh, um, have not enough money we all have to claim our space in the city and we we, we all have our our special places in the, in the city and we have to fight for them maybe that's my my answer Obrigada. Thank you. Well, I think that we are reaching the end of our session. Um, if you would like to add any more comments or if you would like to ask each other questions, please go ahead. Feel free to do so. I, I guess we have to say thank you for this uh, uh, for this wonderful uh, meeting, so it was very professional with all these uh, techniques, with translators. It's, uh, it's um, very impressive. Thank you for this. Yes. And we learned. Thank you. And I learned uh, some new um, ideas from the South and from uh, new words that I can use in the future. The last thing. <laughs> I, I thank you for this. Yes, thank you so much. I was actually very curious to see how the sign language interpreter 
signs longa in doja longa in doja i will go to the youtube to watch but thank you very much for um, uh this uh, this session was really uh, enriching thank you daniel and we we should do a, a course where where we can learn this word from you say to so that that we <laughs> that we pronounce it in the right way <laughs> next time <laughs> next time yeah perfect <laughs> okay thank you and thanks Vamos to the audience <laughs> yes we're going to make it happen for sure Vamos tentar organizar novos we'll try to organize new meetings, maybe in person meetings, so that we can uh, get to see each other in person. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much to you two for your speeches, your presentations, for being so open and generous. There are many links between your presentations and the panel that we had in the morning many uh, topics that uh, the four presenters talked about. So if you were not able to attend the morning session, uh, this is my invitation for you to take a look at it. And tomorrow we are going to have another panel at two o'clock Brazil time. So this is my invitation to you. And on behalf of the organizers of this seminar, once again, thank you very much, Uva and Zetu, and I would also like to thank the entire MASP team, the uh, sign language interpreters, Joyce and Grace, Marília Aranha, Daniele Fonseca, Stella Biagetti, and Maria Garcia, the interpreters, and VIEW Studio, in, which was in charge for all of the broadcast on YouTube. So thank you once again very much. We're very happy that everything worked out with the translation and enjoy the rest of your day or evening. Thank you very much. See you next thank time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Ciao.